नसीम जी वेलकम टू अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया आपने समय निकाला तो बचपन से आपकी पहली यादाश्त क्या होगी अहिंसा के विचार उसके अनुभव या उसके आदर्श की पहली तो मुझे नहीं मालूम लेकिन इतना याद है कि हिंसा से मेरा परिचय बहुत बाद में हुआ आ, पहली यादों में कहीं भी हिंसा तो मुझे नहीं याद आती है 1971 में जब पाकिस्तान के साथ जंग हुई थी तो मैं आठ साल का था उस वक्त और उस वक्त जब सायरन बजते थे तो एक तरह का खौफ होता था उसके अलावा जेपी आंदोलन के वक्त ज्यादातर तो वो आंदोलन नॉन वायलेंट रहा लेकिन कहीं कहीं कभी कभी कुछ इंसिडेंट्स हो जाते थे तो 1974, 75 वो नवनिर्माण मूवमेंट उसके बाद हम तो बहुत छोटे थे लेकिन जब इमरजेंसी हुई पचहत्तर में और जब जेपी का अरेस्ट होता है तो जेपी इज एक्चुअली रिलेटेड टू अस इज सो ही यूज टू कम टू आर हाउस एंड सो ऑन सो दैट हैड शेकन अस अ लॉट सो दैट ऑब्वियसली चेंज वन व्यू ऑफ द लार्जर वर्ल्ड बट एट क्लोज uh hand and in, in, in my own immediate vicinity there was very little violence uh, even verbal violence uh, gali galoj bhi bahut kam suni humne bachpan mein delhi aake sab kuch badal jata hai and the, my whole world changes after i come to delhi and uh, especially after i go to america which is uh, many years later by the time you were in graduate school at america uh, did non violence look like an impossible possibility no um no uh, i think if i am to think of it at, at a larger level i think the turning point is the fall of the berlin wall mm. uh paradoxically because with the end of uh, communist totalitarianism uh everybody was expecting a peace dividend mm. everybody was expecting the world to become more non violent uh because you suddenly had the end of the cold war uh what people forgot was that this cold war was very hot in most of the world uh the west uh, america europe uh, soviet union uh, may have not seen much warfare on their soil but they were fighting proxy wars all over the world um uh, and then so the way one looks at it in retrospect at least is that the peace of the period from say 1945 to 1990 uh should be placed in uh, inverted commas because that was a peace which was held up by mutually assured destruction and those kinds of doctrines yeah uh with the fall of the berlin wall and the unipolarization of the world and everybody wanting to go the american way uh the world became decidedly more violent i think the growth of communication media uh and television satellite television uh, internet uh, smartphone social media all this has meant an acceleration of communication and at the same time a dilution of communication and at the same time an impatience with communication so people's capacity to simply listen with respect and care and patience has declined dramatically i mean if there's one massive casualty of this profound technology it is patience across the world you see this uh, and educators i think are finding it difficult parents are finding it difficult anybody who wants to uh, sort of you know guide younger people is finding this a challenge so um yeah and patience is a important uh feature of our ability to explore the non violence within us isn't it absolutely i mean patience to me is the ultimate art uh, it's it's the it's the it's it's the classic uh, you know art of living i would say uh, needed in every situation 
Um, and I think uh, when people talk about things like attack on civilization, as President Bush did on that occasion, they should also consider the ways in which civilization attacks itself from within uh, through policy decisions, through promotion of certain technologies, through promotion of a certain kind of economic structure. Uh, in all those things, choices are being made, uh, which actually uh, destroy civilization from within like termites. You know, so whether it's greed or fear or impatience, I mean, all these things are, uh, you know, the forces which destroy civilization, actually. I think this is a good point uh, at which I seem you could share your reading of Tagore, because for the last many years, you have been... Uh, studying Tagore in great detail, precisely with this concern. Uh, so can you briefly walk us through the core insights that you have got from Tagore on not only this, how the civilization, when gone wrong, can turn against the individual, but how in the process our capacity to explore nonviolence with him is undermined? Um, one of Tagore's defining moments is the Swadeshi movement, uh, which is in 1905 in Bengal. Curzon has announced the partition of Bengal at the same time, and it leads to huge protests across, you know, Bengal, West and East. Um, and Tagore is very active in the protest. It's given a communal tinge by the British Raj, as uh, you would expect. Tagore takes uh, bold steps against it. He's out on the streets. He's in protest. Uh, he creates the uh, custom of uh, Hindus and Muslims tying rakhis to each other. Uh, as a gesture of uh, mutual peace and so on. But the violence is too big and too large for him to be able to change the course of things. Till 1914, he was relatively optimistic about the Western world. And he had some sort of qualified provisional faith and ideas of progress and so on. After 1914 and what he saw on the battlefields uh, when he visited uh, Verdun and Somme and uh, the battlefields of the First World War after the war was over in 1919, uh, and it left him completely shaken. And it's during this period that he writes nationalism, or rather he lectures on nationalism in three different countries, in India, Japan, and the United States. And uh, as we know, the thesis of nationalism is as simple as it is difficult in the sense of, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's saying that, look, nations are basically organizations of collective selfishness. We hide our selfishness at an individual level by, uh, you know, allowing others to be greedy too, if I may paraphrase him. Okay, and our collective greed for wealth and power takes the form of a modern nation. That's what a modern nation is. Tagore is a far-sighted man and he's able to see where all this is going to lead and which is why he continues to become ever more relevant now because a lot of the things which he anticipates in that period 100 years ago are now becoming obvious even to the person on the street. Uh, so, but, but his main thesis is extremely simple, which is that individual selfishness, you know, becomes collective selfishness, takes the incarnation of a nation state, and all the greed and gluttony of the human heart, all the appetites of the human heart, they take form, institutional form, in the structures of the nation state, and suddenly nobody minds when... Uh, you are willing to sacrifice for this organized selfishness uh, in large amounts of human flesh. Uh, and Tagore is horrified. Um, so uh, 
there's there's a story uh, which I read about a visit that he pays to Japan. I think it's sometime around the early 1920s. And he's with C.F. Andrews, his close friend, the one who introduced him to Gandhi. And um, they visit a school and Tagore is supposed to give a talk at that school. And what do they find? They find that in the school, little children, boys, are dressed in military uniform. And, and they are doing a kind of a march past. And Tagore, uh, uh, Andrews finds it initially cute, you know, and Tagore is indignant. Tagore says, you have no idea how dangerous this is. So he has all these experiences, which I think account for his final disillusionment with Western modernity when he uh, gives his uh, last, what is called his last testament, um, Shobhita Shankar, um, Crisis in Civilization, August 1941. Um, so, there he, uh, he expresses his feelings very honestly and he says, uh, I used to think that, um, you know, uh, the West stood for, uh, you know, liberty and freedom and the highest values of man and so on. But now, uh, as I prepare to say goodbye to this world, I am, you know, in a heap of sorrow. And what is this empire going to leave in India except a vast heap of futility? Those are his words then. A vast heap of futility is what the empire is going to bequeath to India. He's seeing all this as he's leaving the world. This is what I marvel at in the man because despite knowing the future, he still fought for uh, what was true and, and, and right about uh, the human uh, being. And uh, he expresses the faint hope that perhaps the sun of freedom will you know, uh, rise from the east. Uh, and, and that's how he sort of, you know, closes that, uh, that uh, it's a radio recording, um, civilization, crisis in civilization. So, you know, from a time when he used to uh, respect and almost uh, lionize the West, he was influenced heavily by the English romantic poets and by Goethe and Germany and so on. Uh, he reaches a point of complete disillusionment with the modern West. And remember, this is before Hiroshima. And, uh, you know, if you recall, Gandhiji's only response to Hiroshima was long silence. You know? So uh, God knows what they would have thought had they, you know, lived a bit longer and seen how the world went after that. But uh, Tagore gives you the clear impression of, uh, you know, someone who in our language we'll call a drishta, somebody who could see. Uh, who could see into the future because he could see into the depths. And uh, his hope was uh, as much for a future as it was for what, you know, uh, another philosopher calls uh, for the invisible, a hope for the invisible in humanity. Because the largest part of our lives is invisible, but that's actually the most relevant part. And that's what we reflect outside in whatever we do and say and so on. So the, for the inner life of man, Tagore had a lot of worship. I mean, no other word I think uh, describes it. And he had such deep faith in divinity and what he used to call his Jivan Devuta, his, his personal uh, master, and the Vishwa Devuta, the Vidhata, you know, after whom he wrote that uh, you know, song which became a national anthem. Uh, that, you know, uh, he was constantly referring to the values of the Upanishads, you know, Satyam, Shiva, Matvetam, and so on, as guideposts, as ideals, which can always light our path in the darkest of times. And he lived through so much darkness and so much uh, pain and sorrow uh, and come out of it as well, uh, that, you know, you have to marvel at not only the man, but the thing that he worshipped, that it actually was strong enough even for as cruel a world as he saw. For Tagore, the crisis is actually a crisis in modern consciousness. The crisis is in our consciousness. That's where it originates. Uh, one can study this. If one is honest, one can study this in oneself, in how one responds to uh, provocation or uh, challenge from outside. And the kind of visceral uh, feelings which we experience, whether it is resentment or hatred, 
uh, those are the precursors to violence. And I think Tagore's, a lot of Tagore's disagreements with Gandhi, especially when it came to mass politics during the non-cooperation movement and later on as well, had to do with this because Tagore was deeply distrustful of the resentment in people's hearts. And he never believed that you can create a good society if you act from resentment. You know, you have to transcend it somewhere internally and rise to a level where some love appears and which can help you uh, face the, uh, the consequences. Asim, at this juncture, can you s explain in what ways modernity uh, has made a Frankenstein of this? That, because after all, resentment uh, and, and even covetousness are not new to the human experience, but something changed which Tagore could see. And what is the link between this, uh, in a sense, this inflation of resentment and the violence of our times? It's a big question. Um, it's completely right that the human being as such has not changed in you know, 5,000 years or 50,000 years. Fundamentally, we are the same. Uh, which is why I never take the thesis of progress with uh, any sense of belief. Um, the uh, thing that modernity has done, which is radically different from the past, is that it has enshrined the pursuit of power as the overriding goal or, or the overriding motivation of humanity. Psychology of modern man is plagued with the quest for power in an indefinite way. Mm -hmm. So if the will to power is the driving force, you know, uh, then of course, you know, you do not realize what you're losing in the process. You will only see what you're gaining by pursuing power. Mm -hmm. But what you've lost, and this is where Tagore and Gandhi are so crucial because they were pointing out repeatedly to the West what they were losing. Yeah. You know? But Asim, there's just one thing here that then how would we explain that after all history does have an Ashoka up till Kalinga. It has Alexander, it has Genghis Khan, it has the, the whole Roman expansion of empire. How is, how is that different from this will to power that you are now talking about and the violence it inflicts, both internally to the individual and to the society as a whole? So uh, the difference between tradition and modernity in this sense is, uh, is stated very well by a philosopher like uh, Raymond Paniker. He says that traditionally man lived in the cosmos. Modern man lives in history, you know? So now what that means is that with pre-modern technology, uh, your relationship to nature and the cosmos is very real. It's a very everyday thing. You're not cut off, you're not alienated, you're not estranged. You know that not only do you have individual limits vis-a-vis -vis a storm or a cyclone or an earthquake, but the culture, the community, people as a whole, everybody's limited. Human beings are limited in their physical dimension. Human beings are limited and will always remain so. This awareness was there traditionally in all cultures. Even now in indigenous cultures and rooted cultures, in our culture and most ordinary people, this understanding is there. But with the arrival of modernity comes a, a break with this because you have a particular method of inquiry, which is instituted by people like Francis Bacon and Descartes and so on. The whole scientific, modern scientific method, which is a very organized pursuit of knowledge about nature for human purposes, right? Uh, I mean, Bacon says it beautifully. He says, in order to command nature, you first have to obey her, you know? Uh, so, uh, they understood that you, you need to obey nature, but then the purpose is command, right? Now, 
you know, no matter how hubristic Caesar might have been or Alexander might have been or Genghis Khan might have been, I think they knew. They knew their limits somewhere. Napoleon, for instance, on his, uh, you know, after Waterloo and after his defeat, uh, he says that, you know, it's only now I realize that, you know, love is the most powerful source of uh, inspiration for a human being, you know. Or Alexander, when he's uh, being taken, uh, you know, when he's dying of yellow fever, he says, when I'm being lowered in the coffin, please put both my hands outside the coffin because you come with nothing and you can take nothing. So these realizations, <clears throat> they always come to the ancient conquerors or even to Napoleon. But it doesn't come to Donald Rumsfeld. It doesn't come so easily nowadays. What has changed? What has changed is the rise of modern nihilism, which not only means the death of God in, in Nietzsche's sense, it also means the sense of complete alienation from the nature and the cosmos around you. So that alienation means that there are no countervailing values to human power. Modernity thinks of God and King as all, all the same. You know, there is a unipolar understanding of power. Whereas in traditional cultures, there was always some zone of contestation between the Sufi and the Sultan, between the Raja and the Sadhu. And the Raja knew where to back off or where to consult the Sadhu. This loss is, is profound, is very profound. And I don't think more than a handful of people even begin to understand what this means. Okay. Well, one of them is Hannah Arendt, and you have read her. Uh, in in an intense detail. So can you perhaps here bring in how she helps us to understand the difference between force and power and to really understand uh, why, as she says, it is not power that flows from the barrel of a gun. It is only obedience. And how in the process does her analysis of what ails us as a species now, how does it help us to maybe have a better grasp of the possibilities of overcoming the violence? Um, she uses at least three terms which are closely related to each other, but each one very distinct from the other. Force, power, and strength. So, uh, if you begin with power, what she says about power is not how people understand power normally. So power, she says, is a kind of field which comes into play anytime that two or more people come into contact with each other. And, you know, plurality is the condition of you know, human action in the collective sense. And in that plurality, there's always a field of power, uh, which is not per se necessarily a negative thing. You know? It's when this breaks down that force needs to be used. You see? So when it's the, uh, the credibility of this field of power, which you might also call uh, you know, uh, some sense of legitimacy, you know? Uh, you know, when this sense of legitimacy breaks down and there's a crisis of legitimation for the state or for the community or for anybody, that's when we get insecure and violent. Right? So violence is always an expression of weakness. This is not something people understand because it's physically hurtful. So people think, therefore, the person must be strong. So he is being violent. And this is just what is so wrong in our understanding of violence. In violence. Is, Sorry. No, no, go ahead. You finish violence, violence is what people do out of fear. Violence is what people do in order to restore power. Right? So force needs to be demonstrated only so that power can be restituted. If power is unchallenged, force doesn't have to be used. Mm. Right? In uh, what you need to pull out. Now, Go in ahead. what ways, Asim, does uh, this validate Gandhiji's core insight, which came to him mostly from instinct, but also from his active practice of it in politics, this point about how 
violence is the weapon of weakness let me introduce arun's third term which is strength right uh, so what is strength strength is the capacity to not only be alone and feel your solitude as a complete universe but to be able to act in the world alone in the sense of if you believe you are right and if you believe it's truth acting through you it does not matter whether one man opposes you or one million opposes you you go ahead with your action and that is the classic gandhian quality right i mean the capacity to stand for truth at the greatest risk to your physical existence uh if you believe that you are right then you you will face the consequences whatever they are it's irrelevant secondly so the strength aspect is what gandhi emphasizes both in thought word and deed and uh arent however sees it in an apolitical way arent looks at uh you know strength as the quality of let's say an artist who is a dissident in the world who isolates himself from the world in order to practice his art with integrity doesn't care about public act for large and approbation and uh, critical acclaim and things like that and simply pursues his art even at risk of being ignored completely uh so she sort of sequesters the strong away from the political world or the public sphere as it were and this is the difference between gandhi and arent for gandhi uh, strength is precisely the capacity to stand in the face of power and force if need be right and at at mortal risk to your body and your physical being and so on uh and in that sense i have always distinguish and uh, and this is what i teach students also i've always distinguish between liberty and freedom in a way in which perhaps arent may not i don't know i haven't thought enough about her views but my own view is that you know if you put someone like gandhi in prison you take away his liberty you don't take away his freedom because you're not in a position to you cannot right it takes more than guns to kill a man you know it takes more than jails to lock him up and so on uh some of the best work that human beings have produced has come out of jail because precisely uh, you can't take away people's freedom freedom is an ontological reality of the human condition and human beings are cowardly and stupid and ugly when they take it away from others because in the process they also take it away from themselves that's the sense in which they're stupid the sort of things they have to do in order to do this makes the act ugly and it's of course cruel in the obvious sense so uh um, so in that sense violence has nothing 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 defensible about it at any point of time uh unless you want to talk about acts of self defense which the clever human mind always brings up first as though that's how most violence in the world happens which is utter nonsense most violence in the world is happening without provocation most violence in the world is happening out of anger hatred resentment all sorts of feelings in the human heart we don't want to face we are too chicken to face those things we lack courage whoever has his finger on the trigger is the coward and whoever faces the barrel is the man of courage the world understands it exactly the other way around yeah yeah and and this is this is where the problem is uh as you mean what ways has this broad background uh of of intellectual background and, and actually it's a, it's it's a moral uh framework how much has that shaped what you are now teaching as ecosophy and of course you will have to explain to the audience uh what you mean by ecosophy uh because i know that all of this together has helped shape this concept for you uh so can you now tell us about ecosophy yeah i mean just to share a little personal background with you i um as you know i started as an economist and i did all my college degrees and my phd and so on in economics and i ended up with uh, you know a phd in environmental economics on forest management in the himalayas and so on um 
I was not entirely satisfied with the whole thing. I mean, I had very, very deep um, skepticism about economics and more and more critical I became. Ultimately, I quit economics and I moved to teaching philosophy. And But what remained constant through this period was a concern with nature and environment. And so more and more, I began to see the difference between an environmental perspective and an ecological perspective. Uh, environmentalism today is like a universal ideology. It's a no brainer. Uh, Donald Trump too is some kind of an environmentalist. One can argue that. Uh, who is not? Uh, so environmentalism is the way ruling technocracies think about our problems with the natural world and what we are facing, uh, whether it's climate change or air pollution or something else, a pandemic. Uh, ecology is a, a science uh, which is relatively holistic compared to other sciences. It's not reductionist. Uh, it looks at the interdependence of all life and so on. Uh, but it remains a science. It does not, it, it is not able to see nature or non-human nature from the inside, as it were. As, as the, uh, the uh, American writer Ursula Le Guin says, uh, science is an accurate description of the universe from the outside. Poetry is a description of the universe from the inside. So science explicates, poetry implicates, you know. Uh, so ecosophy tries to implicate. So uh, I'll use uh, Paniker, Raymond Paniker's definition of ecosophy, which is a very beautifully elusive definition. It says ecosophy is the wisdom of the earth. You might say it's the wisdom of the cosmos. Now, if you look at philosophy, now philosophy in the classical world meant love of wisdom, philosophia, you know. Uh, which means that wisdom is something apart, in, in, some, some, in some sense distinct from not only love, but also the rest of our minds and our consciousness and our being and so on, right? It is a quest involved, there's a search involved, you know? Likewise, for ecosophy, uh, there is a certain wisdom there somewhere. I'm not saying out there. I'm not saying in here. It's both out there and in here and everywhere. Can we seek it? Can we find it in some way? And how do we go about it? So it's like Panikar says, it's not our wisdom about nature because that, that's, that would make it a science. It's the wisdom of the earth. It's on terms of whatever it is that exists. It might be a mouse, it might be a cloud, it may be a volcano, it might be a cyclone. But all these things have an existence autonomous of us, including the earth itself. Nobody told the earth how to rotate or how to revolve, but it knows how to do all those things. And it optimizes a lot of energy in doing all that. So, um, so in some sense, ecosophy is a quest for that. So that's where I've arrived at after some 35 years of searching in this direction. Uh, and in some ways, I feel the search is only beginning now. So it's kind of an adventure in that direction. And what it helps me to see is the enormous ecological violence of modernity for five centuries. Now, people will immediately get defensive and say, well, humanity has always been uh, violent towards nature, you know, whether it's the Mahabharata or you know, some other epic. I mean, you just have to read the Greek epics and burning of the forest by so many cultures and so on. Uh, and all that may be true. But I think that the means that modernity has created for the uh, disposal of nature and converting nature first into matter and matter into resource, you know, uh, which is the progress of science and its marriage with modern economics, that leads you into this crisis straight away. Uh, so the marriage of three things, it's a tripartite marriage of, of science, uh, uh, of capital, and the state, uh, of, of knowledge, wealth, and power, which has brought you the, uh, to the end of uh, the road for this civilization as I see it. 
Uh, so in that sense, ecosophy is a plea. No, it's not a plea. It's, it's a, at the epistemic level, it's a perspective. It gives you an angle of vision on what is happening. At an ethical level, it's the, it's the quest for uh, reminding people of our place in the scheme of things and to know the conditions on which life is given to humanity. We receive life on certain conditions and they have a considerable latitude to them. There's a lot of variation within, but there are also definite limits and boundaries. And we need to know what those are because at the physical level, we are finite creatures and we are inhabiting a finite planet. And this was to link it with Tagore. Tagore's great quest throughout his life was to harmonize the infinite with the finite. You know, the, the quest of the Upanishads, the Ishavas, the Upanishads. Uh, so ecosophy takes that from uh, Tagore, at least I do. I, I tend to think that uh, without a notion of the infinite or without an experience somewhere of the infinite, human beings find it very difficult to go on living. You know, life does not make a lot of sense because all our meanings and values and cultures are drawn from that uh, ocean. So one must have some awareness of that ocean. Uh, Tagore, uh, you know, does this beautifully uh, in place after place. Uh, so, and the connection with peace is that Panikar says that peace is not something you seek as in you, you seek an answer to a question or something. Peace is something you receive, you know? It's something which comes. And so you have to create room for it because it's not something small. You've made your heart very small. You've lost the integrity of your heart. So if your heart is small, then you won't be able to receive it. So, uh, you know, that again is an invitation to the infinite. You don't cause the rain. You only, you know, take your bowl. So, um, and my understanding of this, and this is the connection with nonviolence, my understanding of this is that if this fullness comes from inside, if this, um, you know, uh, gift of grace comes from within, then you stop harming the natural world then you automatically lose your, uh, your, uh, those uh, desires or those perverse forces which were making you cause the damage in the first place. So it's the lack of inner fullness and wholeness that is leading us to crisis upon crisis and a constant uh, teaching of contemporary modernity at least, of escaping from this condition as though you could, you know. So you want to now escape the earth itself, right? And you have Elon Musk telling you that, you know, uh, we can go to Mars and inhabit uh, Mars, you know. So, and without any guarantee that we won't trash Mars just like we are trashing the earth. So when things are coded into your memory and your habits and your customs and you're constantly in an escape movement, wherever you go, you will bring about the same damage and you will want to escape that. You are the one causing the damage. You are the one wanting to escape from it. You're playing cat and mouse with yourself. You know? So ecosophy is a call to peace here and, and basically to argue that, look, I mean, you know, there's a beauty to this earth. There's a paradise here, which you will not find on Mars. You're simply not going to find this paradise there. Uh, wo, um, so locked in the, uh, in the bosom of my friend is, is the secret of heaven. Uh, should this secret open, I can show you that this world is heaven, right? So what's inside is also outside. What's outside is also inside. We create the world which we are. You know? yeah. So, you know, in many ways, ecosophy chimes with Ahimsa because of this 
because without that ahimsa without that inner peace you know you won't be able to protect uh, yourself let alone nature you know yeah. yeah i know i seem that a lot of your energy comes from your work with young people so in closing could you share what advice or what um hope can you share with young people who i think instinctively share a lot of what you have uh, articulated uh, for example a lot of young people want to take non violence seriously but they feel it's so difficult it's isn't it just for saints and so they flounder on the how of it so what are some of the doable things that you would suggest uh you know which can help particularly young people to navigate the present and 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 say the next 50 years i think in terms of ideas the only simple idea i think it's worth bearing in mind and keeping close to heart all the time is that violence without exception is a sign of weakness it's what cowards do and even when you are acting in self defense right you get violent because you're feeling weak because you feel like you have to so this assertion of power which this world has got addicted to and all its markets and its power structures and everything uh, uh, you know is arranged for it is actually a sign of terrible weakness and it what is what it is saying very clearly to me at least it's it's the end of a certain civilization this is how civilizations have died in history and this one is also dying and justly so and we should not mourn it beyond the point this should go you know but as we say in hindi mara hua haathi bhi sawa lakh ka to it's it's not going to leave us that easily and the reason for that is that we don't seem to have another vision for another way of life another way of thinking another way of being another way of relating to each other and creating human communities and so on uh, which can take its place because the those who have been deciding over the last some generations the the contours of the world have ensured that no other way survives before their ways of the market and so on so first thing is to intellectually educate yourself about the ruses of power about the structures of power and the way power actually works in the world it's sophisticated but not nearly as sophisticated as the human mind is okay which means to say you can understand it this is the one thing we can understand is the way the ways of men can be understood and then i think what remains uh is what will show you what is the way ahead uh and what remains is a much larger thing than you imagine that's my idea of the infinite it inhabits every heart if you know where to look for it and if you draw inspiration from there whether within your own heart or in the heart of another then you are there i mean then you know what to do and here gandhi was a genius because he's able to see the possibilities not the opportunities the possibilities in every situation see otherwise you reduce life to a threat opportunity game which is what you know your video games today are all about you know and it's all very childish and infantilizing you know but gandhi is not an opportunist like that so you're able to divine the possibilities with the 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 space in your heart and that of the other and after a while you begin to see the other as another and then you're there you know you experience a sense of identity and fullness and joy and beauty and a lot comes with it which you cannot even predict and then you realize that you are just the instrument of much more powerful forces not of history but of nature and the spirit that to me is the soul of ecosophy 
Uh, there are forces much stronger than history, but we don't know how to access them. And so part of what we try to do in our classes, in our discussions, is to find ways to get there, is to find ways to, to access that. Is Prakritik Swaraj the Hindi for ecosophy? Uh, Prakritik Swaraj... Dimension. No, it's not another dimension. It's, it's, you might think of it as ecosophy in action. Uh, you might think of it as the practice of ecosophy. Ecosophy is in so many ways an experience. Uh, it's, uh, it's supposed to be a spiritual experience, but equally a cognitive and intellectual experience. And, and everything in between, which is to say the emotions are involved and so on. Uh, Prakritik Swaraj is the... The, the, the same experience and ideas that come with it in action. So what do we do with this? As in what steps do we take? Do we plant a sapling? Do we teach small children? Do we, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, educate uh, older people? One thing which it avoids is politics. Uh, at least any uh, ostensible politics. You can give political descriptions and descriptions, but it doesn't like to associate with an ideology because ideologies have proved to be very divisive things in the world. And I think we can allow for infinite plurality uh, if we do ecosophy properly, then it leaves room for everyone. So everyone is necessary uh, to ecosophy in some ways without anybody becoming indispensable to it, if that makes sense. <laughs> so it's a kind of a paradox. Uh, and I think that's a good attitude to live with. You know, it's, it's, it's everything has its place. Everyone has their place. Um, so, I mean, I think that, you know, uh, for young people, I think the, the, I would say that the adventure ahead is that, you know, uh, you have to create a whole world. You know, because this world is uh, is a done deal, you know, uh, and uh, renew our relationship to the natural world and the earth and the cosmos and the beauty of the darkness and the stars in the sky and uh, the glory of the morning. All that, uh, I think, can be looked forward to. Uh, and so if you have the power and, uh, you know, uh, you have control over the steps in your life early on, you can shape your life in such a way that it moves in that direction over a period of time. And for that, you need to work with a group of people, not just alone, because otherwise you will not succeed in being able to solve larger problems individually. You have to solve them collectively. Thank you so much.